Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors is my favorite game that I've ever played. I picked it up on a whim while browsing Amazon because it looked interesting and it ended up blowing me away. The setting, the story, the characters, the atmosphere, everything about the game hooked me almost immediately. It's a game that I thought a lot about after beating it. It was nice to see that so many others enjoyed the game as well, with most gaming sites giving it 9s and even 10s. Most who played it also shared the sentiment that this game was special, a game worth experiencing. However, as good as the game was, it sold poorly. Perhaps because it was a niche genre that didn't cater to those who were fans of that genre. Most visual novels were very anime and over the top, but this one aimed for a more western style, while clearly still having Japanese influence. The game did a lot better in the west than in Japan though, enough so that a sequel was released, which also got poor sales. Virtue's last reward was grander and longer than 999, and most fans were very pleased with it. But because of poor sales, the series was in jeopardy of never having a third game, which would conclude the series. Long story short, after the fan base diligently worked and showed that they wanted the third game, they got their wish. Zero Time Dilemma was eventually released and everyone was happy. Uh, kind of. Shortly after the release of Zero Time Dilemma, it was announced that the first game, Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors, was going to be ported alongside Virtue's Last Reward to PS4 and Steam, allowing easier access to the first two games in the series since they could only be bought on handhelds beforehand. After the release of the port, people started to discuss which version of the game was the better version. The port changed a lot about the original game. Several quality of life improvements made the game a lot easier to get into and gave you more options, but the writing of the game had to change in order to fit its unique story on consoles, which came in the form of two new modes you could switch between, a novel mode and an adventure mode. One side would discuss that the game is a lot better than it was before because of the quality of life improvements, while the other side would argue that the story was affected in a negative way. From what I've read around online, it looks like the divide comes from how much you prioritize ease of use, or the game aspect of it over the story aspect. Both are important to the audience, but depending on where you lean, you might prefer one version over the other. I think K. Jeweler said it best in his analysis of the game. When considering the various versions, I regard the DS version as the strongest for storytelling purposes, but the Nonary Games version has several big advantages at the cost of that narrative strength. Now, with that out of the way, I won't hide where my biases lie. I'm someone who likes a good story over a good game. I largely prefer the DS version over the port. Admittedly, the story is the biggest factor when it comes to why this is my favorite game of all time. Because of this, the vast majority of the video will be discussing how the writing of the game had to change in order to transfer it to other consoles and why it led to disappointment for me. I'll be discussing how the narration and the character dialogue needed to be changed. I'll then go into the quality of life changes the game has and how that made the ports a better experience gameplay wise. And finally, I'll talk about the ending of the game and how its main twist was affected by the port. A fair warning though, I do get heated a few times throughout the video and end up being very aggressive towards the port with my dissatisfaction towards it. So if that's something you don't think that you'd enjoy, it's understandable if you don't want to watch it. I have strong opinions and end up using very strong wording throughout the video, but please don't interpret that as me trying to state my opinion as fact. The purpose of this video is not to try and convince you that the DS version of 999 is superior to the port. This video also, more than anything, isn't trying to convince you that the port is a bad game. However, personally, the port of the game is disappointing, and with the very nature of the original version, there wasn't any way that the port could have stayed faithful without feeling forced in some way. The inclusion of the new novel and adventure mode mechanic itself changed a lot about the writing from the DS version of the game. Changes that affected far more than just the plot twist at the end of the game. You can imagine my surprise upon hearing the news that 999 was going to get a port to consoles. 999's narrative was centered around the Nintendo DS and its two screens. Just how were they going to make that work with only one screen? 999, as a whole, has a great thought-provoking story with deep and interesting characters. I've never had a game, or even any form of media, make me think about its story as much as 999 did. It had me at the edge of my seat nearly the entire game, made me suspicious of characters and their motives. It made me theorize and then rethink the entirety of the game when new information came along. And, with the build-up the game had towards its main twist, it blew my mind harder than anything I've experienced before or since. Because of the nature of the story and the twist being centered around the DS's two screens, when porting the game over, they had to figure out a way to fit that into one screen and still have it make sense. The solution they came up with was to have two different modes that you could switch between. Adventure mode, which included just the character dialogue, and novel mode, which added narration to the dialogue. They give you the option to freely switch between these modes, but because of this change, they ran into 
another problem. People are most likely going to pick one mode and stick to it throughout the entire game. This isn't a problem for people who pick novel mode. They get all the information they need. But what about the people who choose adventure mode? The narration in this game is absolutely essential. Without it, the game wouldn't just not make any sense, but the twist at the end wouldn't be a twist anymore. It would be out of place, something that came out of nowhere. Without it, Junpei's thoughts and feelings couldn't be expressed. Things that are obvious to the cast but not to the audience would go unexplained. The people who choose adventure mode would be lost and confused, unable to follow along. So, how do you fix a problem like this? What can they do to make both modes make complete sense in regard to the story? In the end, they use two methods to try and fix this dilemma. The first is force switching between the two modes when important information is being given through the narration. This method is used very sparingly for whatever reason, however. Besides the true ending, there are only a few places where they force switch you into novel mode. Instead, the method they used primarily was transferring lines of narration over to the character's dialogue. With this change, you can now get all the important information you need no matter which mode you're currently in. Perhaps they thought this was the best option, because it was either that, or keeping it the same as the DS version with the top and bottom screen being unchanged when porting the game, which would lose important story information for those who mainly stayed in adventure mode. On paper, this should work great. This way, everyone can understand and experience the story. It should work fine, right? Those who choose adventure mode have the benefit of not having extra text getting in the way, having more room for interpretation, and making the progression of the story faster. And those who choose novel mode have the benefit of building a chilling atmosphere as well as additional detail to the story. This should work fine, right? <sighs> okay, I won't beat around the bush and just come right out and say it. This simple change to the game causes problems with the writing, especially the first two or three hours of the game. Granted, it doesn't make the story bad, but a lot of the magic of the DS version is lost in translation from handheld to console. A lot of the plot points don't hit nearly as hard and can often be more confusing overall in an already convoluted game. Shockingly, the inclusion of the two new modes is the one change I see very few people talk about. Most discussions revolve around the quality of life changes. When novel and adventure adventure mode is brought up, the discussion usually revolves around if the lack of narration creates more or less of an impact in the game. Is the game as atmospheric in adventure mode? Does novel mode tell you too much and leave too little to your imagination? It's an interesting discussion. However, I rarely see these discussions talk about the impact of the writing that was changed in order to fit these new modes. And I'm not talking about the ending. I'm talking about the actual writing and character dialogue and how it had to change. Out of all the research I did, I was only able to find three instances of people bringing this up. Unlike the DS version, the narration isn't necessary to understanding the game in the port. In most cases, they took the line out and reworded it to make it fit into what the characters were currently saying. For example, at the beginning of the game, when Junpei is recalling is kidnapping, the narration adds a subtle but important line that there was no way of telling if the captor was male or female. In the port, that line was taken out and given to Junpei. Well, I, I guess there's no way to know if that was a man or not. This is a smart way to compensate for only having one screen while still having the story remain the same. However, the way in which they handled it is questionable at best. As another small example, at the beginning of the game when the group is trying to see if there's an easier way out, Junpei looks to the ceiling and sees that it's bolted shut with a metal plate. In the DS version, the narration adds two lines before moving on, mentioning that a metal plate was covering what seemed to be a glass dome and that nothing but an explosion was likely to damage it. It's a quick scene, lasting maybe 10 seconds with your average reading speed. Not super important. In fact, it probably wouldn't change the narrative at all if it was left out, but at least it drives the point home that they're stuck. So, imagine you're porting this game and need to convey the scene without the use of narration for the people who aren't in novel mode. How would you handle it? Perhaps Junpei could quickly look at the ceiling and in frustration say that it's no good either and that it's being sealed by a metal plate. Perhaps another character can chime in expressing their frustration as well. Something like this would be quick and convey the same message as the original version. The port, however, feels the need to copy every bit of narration to a T and give it to the characters. Junpei looking at the ceiling. Check. Someone mentioning it looking like a dome. Check. Something being said about it being a metal plate. Check. They even felt the need to add a bit of dialogue to Clover so Santa could respond with the explosives comment. Though I find this method questionable, it's not a terrible way of doing it if done right. However, the small sequence does feel a bit awkward. The visual should be enough to convey to the audience what they need to know without the narration. This makes the scene feel a bit forced, especially with the situation they found themselves in, and at the very beginning of the game to boot. By itself though, this 10 second scene isn't that big of a deal. Now imagine doing it this way throughout the entire game.
The way they handle transferring the lines of narration to the characters drives me insane, and it's abundant in the first few hours of the game. There is so much information that needs to be given at the beginning of the game, but instead of forcing the player into novel mode, they try and transfer almost everything to the character dialogue. Even from the very beginning of the game, something just seems off. Junpei, for the first 20 or so minutes of the game, is by himself, and is presented immediately with a strange and unfamiliar setting. In the original, he's mostly silent while he's in the first escape room, saying just a few lines of dialogue to himself. During this time, however, the narration is giving us Junpei's thoughts and feelings, what he's experiencing, the questions he has, everything he's taking in. It's all important information because it establishes the setting of the game and Junpei's character. So how does the port handle this scene? I felt pretty far. Really hurt. Damn, my eyesight's kind of blurry. Must have hit my head. Uh, an earthquake. Uh, but it—it's shaking too fast for that. What's this? Uh, is this keeping the door shut? Uh, man, work was rough today. Junpei endlessly talks to himself. Now, talking to yourself isn't inherently a bad thing, and I know some of you are already saying that this is normal. I can recall various times in media where a character is thinking to themselves about a problem or something similar, but Junpei isn't doing that here. He's narrating the story out loud to himself, and he never shuts up. In the DS version, from the time between when the game starts and starting the first puzzle, Junpei has 24 dialogue boxes. In the port, he has 53. The overabundance of this leads to lines that are not only unnecessary, but are just so forced and awkward. Damn, my eyesight's kind of blurry. Must have hit my head. Are we supposed to think that he's thinking in his head right now, or that like he's just self-narrating out loud to everybody? I... I feel like there has to be like a third party, right? An earthquake? But it, it's shaking too fast for that. Uh, anyway... That's the moment you say anyway? Yeah. An earthquake? Nah, eh, it can't be that. There's a lot of moments <sighs> like that. Maybe pushing something on this will work? I wonder, if, he, I wonder if he's talking out loud to himself in this room like this. Or if this is like inner monologue. <laughs> if someone talked to themselves like this constantly, the you know they're crazy. This? Man, work was rough today. Who are you talking to? Damn this water. God, let me go. Yeah, let me go, water. How yes. dare you? B deck. So we went from C deck to B deck. Hurry, hurry. A deck's next. That's how they are. Right, that's work. how. <laughs> Now, not every line of dialogue spoken to himself sounds forced. I can see myself in this situation saying some of these lines, but coupled together with everything else he says to himself constantly, it gets really obnoxious. Especially since it's literally non-stop as soon as you start the game. Too much of anything is a bad thing, and the amount that Junpei talks to himself just comes off as unnatural. In fact, the flashback that happens during the first puzzle room has no dialogue spoken by Junpei at all in the DS version. Not a single word is spoken to himself. It's shown to us naturally. Junpei coming to his house, noticing the window is open, shutting it, and bam, Zero is there and kidnaps him. The narration gives us a little more information regarding his college life and work, but it isn't much, and it doesn't feel forced because it was written with the narrator in mind. You can imagine, though, that without the narration, the scene would just feel off. It would kind of feel a bit awkward for just the images to slowly show one after the other before Zero shows up. So, to fix this, they added 11 dialogue boxes in a scene that originally had none, and most of of them are of him talking to himself. And yes, it's just as forced and awkward as that sounds. I'm back. Not like anyone will respond. Ugh, man, work was rough today. You know, as I played the port, nothing really bothered me about it until this point. Sure, the lines where Junpei talks to himself about seeing a bed, hitting his head, and feeling what seemed to be an earthquake were annoying, but it didn't set off any huge red flags. It was at this point in the game where I started to worry that this sort of thing would be common. Junpei constantly talking to himself in a super forced and awkward manner. And okay, look. It's normal to talk to yourself sometimes, but at this point Junpei has done nothing but that in two different situations. Being in an unfamiliar place that is possibly dangerous, and in his normal everyday life coming home from work. In these two instances, isolated from each other, it wouldn't be too weird to add maybe a line or two where the character talks to himself, but this is already going overboard. It's an obnoxious way to be fed information. It's like the beginning of an anime starting off with the main character just narrating to themselves so the audience knows what's going on instead of just showing us 
what their life is like. Hi, I'm so-and-so, and I go to blank high school, and this is my everyday life. Can you imagine walking to school one day and then suddenly start talking to yourself about your life, your friends, your situation at home, how your school life is, and your entire life? This is what that feels like, but even worse. The game constantly has Junpei, and the other characters for that matter, point out really silly and obvious things to move the scene along. Perhaps because the game only has steel images and character portraits to work with. But honestly, those should be enough without having to add annoying dialogue. It's so frustrating because I can't see any sane person acting like this. After a high pressure situation, one where you just barely escape and preserve your life and are probably having an adrenaline rush, can you imagine yourself saying something like this? Whew. That felt too much like being flushed down a toilet. Damn. I'd be freaking the crap out, not even thinking, trying to find my way to safety. I wouldn't stop and think to myself, oh, a door, eureka, that's my way to safety right there. But this accursed water, it is slowing down my movement and therefore decelerating my way to security. Okay, that's an extreme example. But honestly, it's everywhere in this game. So it gets to the point where I wouldn't even be surprised if Junpei did end up saying something like this. Things shown and seen directly to the player should be enough. But the game feels it necessary to add character dialogue to it anyway to state the obvious, and it drives me absolutely insane. C deck. Er, yeah, that's C deck. There's a massive zoom in on the play so that it's the only thing on screen. But okay, whatever, right? It's just him saying what's in front of him. No big deal when it's isolated. B deck. Like I said, in this game, it's never an isolated event because it's everywhere. It's so frustrating because it feels like every 15 seconds I'm telling the game to stop telling me what's right in front of my face. It's almost embarrassing how hammy these lines are. Who talks to themselves like this? It's like every time I wanted to start up playing again, another stupid line would be said. Well, it registered my bracelet number, but it won't open with one person. We need at least two more people. At this point of the game, we already know this. Junpei already knows this. Why does it need to be repeated by him? Heck, he's the one that read this out loud to everyone. Not only that, but mere minutes before this, he repeated it again in his head anyway to get the point across. This is literally the third time he's gone through this. Why does Junpei need to repeat what the narrator says in the original? When things like this are stated in the narration, it comes off as much more natural because the narrator is the mediator between what's happening in the story and the audience. These things might not be obvious to the audience who isn't actually there. In the DS version, the narrator says that Junpei had scanned his number, but two more people were needed to open the door. That's it. In the port, Junpei essentially says the same thing to himself when he already knows it. This is a line that actually could have been excluded. Instead, it could have been something like him scanning his number, an ellipsis appearing to convey a pause, and then Junpei saying, hey, we need two more numbers, could someone give me a hand? And then present the options. This should do it. Now we just need to pull the lever on the side. Imagine if you actually spoke to yourself like this. Getting up in the morning and removing your covers. Darn this blanket. Let. Me. Go. You get up and head to the kitchen and say every serial name in your head before finally deciding on one. Now I just need to raise my right hand and pick the third serial box to the left. Like, no one does this. I mean, I'm not inside any of your heads or anything, but can you honestly tell me that you or anyone else is this obvious and detailed about everything you do when talking or thinking to yourself? During the scene where the cast is writing down what doors they want to go through on separate pieces of paper, Junpei has a plan that he's already thought through before the scene even happens. It wasn't shown to the audience before the scene though, so after he draws and his plan is successful, he finds it necessary to explain his plan to himself again in great detail, almost as if he were explaining it to someone else. I had three pieces of paper ready, and I put the one with door six on it into the pot. I just needed to make sure I drew last. After I saw everyone else's result, I just chose whatever door I wanted. If the number I'd already put in matched, then I didn't have to switch the paper out. Thanks for reaffirming that for yourself, Junpei. I was worried that you were going to forget after your plan succeeded. Yes, there are instances where Junpei talks to himself in the original. I'm arguing that talking to yourself to this extent is very unusual. The only times I catch myself talking to myself to this extent is when nothing else is happening around me, or I'm totally uninterested in my surroundings. Like trying to fall asleep at night, sitting through a boring lecture, or working at a super repetitive job. But Junpei and the others 
were kidnapped. Junpei barely escaped a flooding room. He is in an unfamiliar setting with strange and unfamiliar people. Ugh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. After Junpei escapes the room and heads to A deck, he runs into the rest of the cast and almost immediately we run into another problem. Similar to how Junpei just annoyingly talks to himself to no end, as soon as the other characters are introduced, they're given lines of narration to add to their dialogue. Except, instead of just talking to themselves, they point out stupid and obvious things to each other. This is a numbered door! See what I mean? Do you see what I mean about them, like, just pointing out the obvious? This is a numbered door! And because the dialogue is so different from the original, other lines need to be changed as well so the scene can actually make sense. For example, one of Lotus's first lines to Junpei, Hey, you, come on, hurry, is changed to fit the new dialogue Junpei was given from the narration. I guess there's another one of us now. Uh, a, a, a dancer? No, I'm not. You better get moving. The urgency is taken out. Oh, uh, well, okay then. Actually, this entire scene of Junpei meeting the characters for the first time has no urgency at all anymore. Junpei doesn't seem to be worried, but is instead talking to himself about what these strangers look like to him. Not to mention that there's so much dialogue added that instead of it feeling like they're running past Junpei in a hurry, now it just feels like they're in a line waiting to introduce themselves to him. Because of these changes, a lot of the tension from the original game is gone. Moments of silence that were supposed to be stressful for the characters and the audience end up being ineffective because someone has to say something to compensate for the lack of narration. That was all one sentence. There are so many examples where they really, really didn't need to add lines from the narration. In the original version, as you're meeting all the characters for the first time, as they're rushing by, the narration gives them all a descriptive title since they are in too much of a hurry to introduce themselves. Santa is silver, Ace is lion, Seven is mountain, and so on. This information actually isn't important to the story, it just gives it more personality and character. Now, it's important for the sake of the audience so they can be familiarized with these characters, but the information itself isn't important to understanding the story. It also isn't important because it is never alluded to again in the entire game. It's just a quirky way to introduce the characters. And because it isn't significant, it isn't necessary to translate it over for someone else to say. But hey, they went ahead and did that anyway. Most of the dialogue in the scene in the DS version are characters muttering to themselves and telling Junpei to hurry up as they run by. In the port, the scene is slowed down dramatically to fit this information that isn't actually important. Junpei talks to the others and to himself about what the others look like. Just what is going on? There's an old man like a lion, a girl with pink hair, and a prince, and I have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, it doesn't sound natural at all. Like, imagine describing someone you just met like this in front of their face. That glasses guy with hair like a bird's nest. Just because it's in the narration doesn't mean it needs to be transferred over. After running into the majority of the cast, you're finally introduced to Akane, and I'd like to just bookmark this scene for now so I can talk about it in detail later because it highlights a slightly different discussion. For now, there's still more I want to discuss. I've mentioned before that Junpei would say obvious things to himself and to the other characters when it really isn't necessary, but what about when it is necessary? Points in the game where every character knows what's going on but isn't immediately apparent to the audience. In the original, the narration would just take over and explain the situation, because it would be quite strange for the characters to describe to each other what they already know. So naturally, the port handles this by having the characters explain to each other what they already know. After meeting Akane, Zero explains the situation they're in through a speaker and says they have 9 hours to escape. A clock then rings 9 times to let them know what time it is. In the DS version, everyone is silent. It's obvious to everyone what's happening. No words are needed. But, just in case it wasn't obvious to the reader, the narration gives a simple explanation of what's happening while creating the atmosphere. Because you may never be in novel mode at all during the port, the characters have to speak up and tell each other the obvious, almost as if they're breaking the fourth wall as they explain to the audience what's going on. I hear a bell. I think it's coming from over by the stairs. Okay, these lines aren't that bad, right? It's a little awkward, perhaps, but not terrible. I can see something like this being said in this situation. It's the clock telling us the time. But then Snake jumps in and tells everyone the obvious. Naturally, everyone would be able to deduce what was happening within seconds, as said in the DS version where everyone just automatically turns to the sound. But even still, if it stopped right here, it would just be one awkward line. We could move on. But then it just keeps going, and going, and going. It rang nine times, so nine o'clock then? I think it's 9 p.m. I couldn't see anything when I tried looking out the window earlier. It has to be nighttime. 
Actually, with their situation, since they're all strangers, it's much more likely that they'd all remain silent. Not to mention that this scene is juxtaposed with what Zero just said 15 seconds ago with how much time they have left to escape. Whether it's important dialogue or not, the writers deemed it necessary to give it to the characters. It happens. What is this? It looks like a lowercase h with a dash drawn across the upper stem of the h. So often. What is this would have been fine. This is a literal actual copy of the narration taken over to the dialogue. This bears repeating. Things that sound natural with narration doesn't necessarily mean they'll sound natural if someone actually says it out loud. A beep? Did that thing just make that sound? Ugh. How am I still pausing the game and ranting about this? I can see it happening a few times, but oh my gosh, how does it just keep happening? There are so many times where I would say no crap when playing the port because of how obnoxious it is for them to always point out the obvious and describe their surroundings to everyone, even though everyone in the room should already know. Um, the display changed from engaged to vacant. The game tries to make these changes to the text seem as natural as possible, even trying to throw some kind of logic in there. I think we should look at the metal doors by the big staircase, too. They're pretty suspicious. Hey, old man! Give me a hand! Using force, I see! All this extra dialogue just makes it seem like even more of a stretch that they were actually on this boat for nine hours. Using force, I see! Let's <laughs> Thanks, Lion! I see this method! <laughs> what a novelite approach! Granted, this is a problem in the original as well, like the others trying to find a different way to escape when they should have just clearly played the game, but it's a much bigger problem in the port. I've mentioned this briefly before, but I think the game would have benefited greatly by force switching into novel mode more often than it does. A lot of these terrible lines wouldn't be necessary, as they'd be able to keep the original script intact for that section. Let's go back to when we were introduced to Akane. For this scene, the game switches you forcefully into novel mode for the first time. As you can expect, very little from the scene was altered in any way from the DS version. Now, to reiterate, altering something isn't inherently bad. I'm not complaining about the port because they're different, but because of the way it was handled. Right here though, because it's forced into novel mode, they could transfer the script over without changing anything. People say that it's fine to play the game only in adventure mode because the game will switch you to novel mode when it's important. Here's the thing though, the game only does this a total of five times in the entire game, twice if you're only going through the necessary routes. It switches when meeting Akane for the first time, the rabbit flashback, the knife ending, the sub ending, and during the twist in the true ending, where you then lose the ability to control which screen you want to be in. Not the axe ending, not the safe ending, not when the ninth man explodes, not when finding Snake's body in the shower room, not when finally finding the ninth door, not when the narrator takes over for long periods of time in the original, and certainly not during anywhere in the beginning of of the game, besides meeting Akane for the first time, these moments that made the game so intense for me, so memorable, are made into ghosts of their former selves. Speaking of the two deaths that were caused by explosion though, a common complaint I see amongst most people is that the gruesome narrations for the deaths in this game are now optional, only accessible in novel mode. Seems like these parts of the game were very memorable for people. In my opinion, the ninth man's death, coupled with the narration's description of his bloody remains, is an important moment that sets up the tone of the game more than anything else had before it. Then again, with Snake. Uh... Okay, yeah, Snake. His death in the gruesome scene before us is even harder to bear because Snake was a much more likable character than the Ninth Man and had more screen time. Dang, imagine seeing the horrible bloody remains of someone you're fond of. That's a haunting scene right there. If you were really there, the initial shock might make you involuntarily scream in horror. If it was someone you really did know, it would probably be a huge blow to your psyche, perhaps only being able to utter their name. Maybe a sentence or two being said. It'd probably be too much to even look at. Oh god. The bone is coming out of his left arm. It's definitely an open fracture. Oh, the face. It's horrible. Yeah, you can't even tell who it is. Holy crap, dude. Like, someone you knew just died in an awful way. I know you've only known him for a few hours, but talking like this in front of such a haunting scene is just so senseless and unnatural. Like, who talks like this in front of someone who just died, especially the way Snake did? Have some respect for the dead. Can you see yourself saying something like this in front of something so awful? They didn't do this with the ninth man. To me, besides a line or two being said, the more natural thing would to be in total silence, in complete and utter devastation. Like in the DS version! Oh my gosh, dude! Just 
Imagine how easy it would be and how much of a better option it would have been to just switch to novel mode for such an intense scene. The narration in the scene is important to the plot later on, so of course they transferred the lines over, but this problem wouldn't be here if they just switched over to novel mode. Five times. Five times in the entire game is how often they switch to novel mode by force. Do you really think that the narration in 999 is only important five times? In the ninth man's case, you only get a bloody wall. To their credit, the characters did stay mostly silent in that scene. And thank goodness too, because them just describing to each other the gore would be, well, just as bad as everything else we've talked about. But doing a simple switch to novel mode here would have been perfect. Holy crap, this is actually happening, this isn't a joke, and it's not pretty. The blood and guts are everywhere, and the reality of the situation sets in as it actually tells you the realistic outcome of such an explosion. But because it doesn't switch you to novel mode, if you are in adventure mode, you just miss it. Like I said, all you get is a blood wall and Junpei talking to himself, holy crap. All this goes back to what we were talking about before with forcing the player into novel mode. So many of these problems we've been talking about since the beginning of the video could have been fixed if they just switched to novel mode more often. Junpei constantly talking to himself, the character's unnatural dialogue and always stating the obvious, everything. It might have created some issues with people being annoyed by the constant switching, but at least people would be painfully aware of the existence and importance of both screens. It's a better problem to have than the one we have currently with the game. The audience could ask the question, why are these modes so important to begin with, and why are they switching so often? But as it currently is, it doesn't switch nearly as often as it should. Gosh, man, I want to say that the writing in this game is good. I want to say that the characters all act and speak naturally. I want to say that the novel and adventure modes were handled well and that everything works seamlessly. Of course I want to say these things. This is my favorite game of all time. Of course I want to say positive things about it. Of course I want to recommend it to others. But I just can't bring myself to do it after playing through the port. And I know this is only my opinion, but I'm just so done with this game. And I'm done beating around the bush. This sucks. This is bad writing. It's terrible awkward, forced, and really distracting. It muddies a game with a great story. It's like if movie adaptations to books felt the need to have every single line of narration added to the character dialogue to get the full experience. Sure, you can now watch your favorite book in its entirety as a movie, but does that mean that the movie adaptation is actually good? It's getting harder and harder for me to keep saying that the port is still a good option, and we still haven't talked about everything. Am I crazy? Am I overreacting? Am I the only person that's bothered by this? Like. This was originally going to be a simple 10 minute video explaining how the endgame plot twist was affected in the port. Nothing controversial. Everyone seems to agree that the DS version handled the twist better. I wasn't expecting to make an hour long video of me railing on the port. I mean, confession time, I guess. Before making this video, I never actually played the port. I just knew that the plot twists were negatively affected by watching people play the game on Twitch. So when I actually started playing it to make this video, imagine my surprise when the dialogue was this awful. I had to go back to the DS version to make sure that my nostalgia wasn't clouding my judgment. But... You get my point. I have more written down in my notes about other lines that bothered me and that highlight somewhat different problems, but you get it. I don't like how they handle transferring the lines of narration over to the character dialogue. These issues happen so often after you start the game that, when I was first writing this, I almost thought that the entire game would be like this. But like... It isn't. For some reason, sometime after Doors 3, 7, and 8, the terrible writing and dialogue slows down quite a bit. It went from me pausing the game every 30 seconds to rant, to me normally playing the game. Now, it's still present throughout the game, and we've talked about a few instances of it happening later in the game, but instead of it happening once every 30 seconds, it happens once every 10 to 15 minutes, which is a massive improvement. Junpei, for the most part, doesn't constantly talk to himself anymore. The character's dialogue isn't stupid or cringy. It mostly becomes the game I know and love. Until the true ending, that is. We'll get to that. This might be because most information in the narration at this point isn't needed as much in order to understand the story, so perhaps that's why it didn't feel the need to copy any more of it to the character dialogue. Granted, I still think that being in adventure mode puts you in a lesser position than in novel mode, depending on your preferences, I guess, but it overall becomes a better game. So does that mean the rest of the game is fine then? The script more or less fixes itself after you get past the beginning, so is the game the same experience after this point? Should you power through the beginning to experience the rest of the game? Well... Huh? Uh, huh. <sighs> <laughs> it's complicated. Jeff Probst. Consider this a privilege. You have been chosen. 
Let's take a break from talking about the negatives for a moment and discuss the positives the port brought, because I'm going to be yelling again in 10 minutes and I need a breather. The quality of life changes added to the port are great. A lot of the problems that the DS version had were fixed in the port. Some of the main gripes people had with the original are as follows. Slow, unskippable text, starting over from the beginning of the game after getting an ending, and the lack of clear direction on where to go and what choices lead to what endings. Not only did they fix these problems, but other things were upgraded as well, such as upgrading the sprite work of the original to make it look cleaner. As I've mentioned already, 999 isn't a perfect game, and the DS version has its share of problems. Something that would always get an audible groan out of me when playing the original is if I accidentally clicked on an object in a puzzle room right after I had finished reading it. The text crawl in this game is slow and set at one speed. You cannot skip it. So, of course, I'd be mashing on the touchscreen to finish the text, only for me to accidentally click on the same object again. Fun times. So thank goodness that's not a problem in the port anymore. If that same example were to happen in the port, you could actually just mash your way through the text and be done with it in a flash. It's also helpful during the story since you can play the game at your own pace if you're okay with cutting the character's voice acting mid-sentence. The slow crawling text in the DS version was annoying enough for someone to create a mod of 999 where the text is faster. A literal mod of 999 that does nothing else but speed the text up. That's how annoying it could get. Something that actually wasn't a problem in the original version were the character sprites, but they went ahead and upgraded those too. To be honest, it would be kind of jarring to see the sprites on an HD TV. Every character looks very clean now, and some even have added details. There are some examples where the upgraded models look a little awkward, mainly the ninth man looking away from you instead of at you, but for the most part it's all very nice looking. However, that doesn't mean that the sprite work in the DS version is bad. It's upscaled in the port for sure, but the sprite work in the DS version still looks great. I wouldn't say that going from the port to the DS version would be a downgrade to the character models. It's like saying that going from the upgraded version of Bowser's Inside Story for 3DS to the original on DS is a downgrade when the graphics for each version looks great. The sprites don't look bad and have a certain charm to them. And heck, with games like Phoenix Wright, I still prefer the DS Wright models over the upgraded ones. One downside is that even though they did upgrade the character models, a lot of things went untouched, like some puzzle rooms and still images. Some things transferred over well and still looks good without really doing much to the model. Models. But then you have things like this, or this, where it looks either pixelated or smeared. Kind of a stark contrast to the great looking character models. It's not enough to pull you out of the experience, it's just kind of off-putting. With that out of the way, one of the biggest quality of life changes is the voice acting, with the option to choose between the English and Japanese dub. Voice acting in itself brings an interesting discussion about creative interpretation. One argument in favor of adventure mode goes something like this. Not having narration leaves more room for interpretation, and therefore is better than novel mode. Honestly, I think that argument kind of goes against the game as much as it goes in favor of it. Having voice acting in this game is, in a way, having less room for interpretation than in the DS version. Much like reading a book over its movie adaptation, on the DS, you give the characters different, unique voices and every line of dialogue is performed in your head. With the inclusion of voice acting, it's done for you. Don't get me wrong, I don't think either option is better than the other, but that the argument can go both ways. In fact, it's probably Probably the most common comment I see from a veteran player when hearing the voice acting for the first time. This isn't how they sounded in my head, but that's to be expected, right? Personally, I think the voice acting in the port is good, even if I prefer not to have it on. I'd say the majority of the cast is great. There are a few hiccups here and there though. Using force, I see. But these instances are occasional, only happening every so often. They can be annoying, but it doesn't happen so often that it takes you away from the game. By itself. I think the nature of the over-the-top writing kind of makes for some awkward deliveries, but it's not an inherently bad thing and most people get used to it. Though I'll never be able to take Junpei constantly talking to himself seriously, no matter what language it's in or how well it's voice acted. Despite the characters not sounding the same as they were in my head, I don't think anyone has a particularly bad performance. However, there are some bizarre creative directions they took when it came to the voice acting, especially with the English dub. Knockout gas. Thanks, gig name. Consider this a privilege. You have been chosen. Oh, I don't know about this voice. Zero's distorted voice is... bad. There's no other way around it. It's bad. Perhaps they wanted the voice to get a reaction out of people, because you could argue that the voice creates fear or discomfort. It's also debatable whether the voice fits the original description or not either. A rasping voice formed its w wormed its way out of the gas mask. You think that's raspy? Listen, they did the writing before they did the voice acting. 
Zero's voice does not create fear though, it's just funny. I'm sure it'd be scary if I were to hear it in real life, but that's only because I wouldn't be able to understand a single thing this guy was saying. If it weren't for the subtitles, I would be completely lost. The fact that the characters can understand anything this guy is saying is beyond me. <laughs> what? Exactly. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know what he said. I, I closed my eyes and I, I have no idea. If I were to cover up Zero's dialogue box, could you honestly tell me that you don't have any problems understanding him at all? The sixth the sinister impression I had for this guy and deformed it into something I can't take seriously at all. It's so freaking goofy that I can't help but get frustrated because it takes me out of the game. The booping noises in the original gave the impression that his voice sounded a lot more ominous and disturbing. Zero doesn't appear in the game that often though, so this isn't that big of a deal. But Zero is the main antagonist. I'd love it if I felt threatened at all by this guy. The very end of the safe ending is just humorous now, when before it was one of my favorite moments. But like I said, Zero doesn't appear that often, so it isn't a huge problem. No, there's a different questionable decision that takes me out of the experience worse than Zero does, and it does so far more often. It happens in the form of ellipsis. An ellipsis is usually used for pauses and silences, and 999 uses them several times throughout the game. There are many times when the characters will react with silence for various reasons. In the port, it upped the number of times the characters did it because of the new dialogue they added or changed. That itself shouldn't be a problem. But... For some miserable reason, they decided that it would be a good idea to have the characters grunt and gasp every single time an ellipsis shows up on screen. Uh. <sighs> so, imagine you're playing through the game, about three-fourths of the way through, and you decide to go through Door 6, the steam engine puzzle room. You complete it, and the cutscene plays where Santa pulls out a picture of his sister and tells you a story about him being her Santa Claus. It's a great moment, and it gives us more insight on Santa's background and his character. Such a scene gives off a certain somber mood. It gives us more sympathy for a character that's been mostly seen as bombastic and foul up to this point. As seen in the original, the reaction of silence is appropriate. So imagine not doing that at all. I wonder which Santa I am. The white Santa or the black Santa? Huh. Aww. Uh. Hmm. Can I please get some atmosphere in this game without it being totally butchered? When I said that a character makes noise each time an ellipsis shows up, I mean each and every time a character is given an ellipsis. Why the heck do they have to have a voice clip for every single time they come up? It's already hard enough for me to take the game seriously because of everything we've talked about so far, but it makes it even harder when every ellipsis in the game is someone breathing, gasping, or making some other weird noise. And unlike most of the character dialogue, the ellipsis problem never goes away throughout the entire game. When Ace is telling his haunting story about how he killed Clover in a gruesome way, just for the rest of the cast to react in stupid noises for no reason when it's supposed to be silent, it's so infuriating. <sighs> Can I please just have one moment with this game? One moment that's not ruined by Junpei talking to himself, the characters pointing out stupid and obvious things, Zero's goofy voice, the occasional awkward voice directing, or an ellipsis? It's like it never ends! If it's not one thing, it's one of the others. The bad writing finally eases up around the two hour mark, but then you have to deal with everything else! I just want to be immersed in this world, but it's impossible when something happens every few minutes. When I first played 999 on the DS, I was so immersed that it didn't let go of my attention until I beat it. Yes, there are negative aspects present in the original as well, and I can give several examples of them, but it happening every once in a while compared to once every couple minutes is a huge difference. At first, I thought they were just trying to imitate the Japanese dub because anime has a tendency to do that with their characters, making over-exaggerated grunts and noise at the slightest indication of movement. But the Japanese dub actually doesn't do this at all. The ellipsis in the Japanese dub actually indicates silence for the characters. Holy crap, dude! I have no idea why they added this to the English version. It just makes the characters sound... silly. You know, most of these problems would be solved if you just turn the voices off. The game gives you that option. Yeah.
This is a fair point. If you can't stand the ellipses like me, you can simply turn the voices off so you don't have to hear them. That also fixes the awkward deliveries that you hear from the voice actors every so often. However, I'd argue that when a game has a feature that you're not using, it feels like you're missing out. If the option to turn it off is only for the people who played the DS version, then why can't I have my booping noises? I... I like my booping noises. Especially when I'm in novel mode at all times and both the narration and the character dialogue fill the entire screen. It can be hard to tell who's speaking or not when the voices are completely turned off. Having the character speak and having no noise to indicate it makes it lack life and personality. Compare turning the voices off yourself and hearing the characters speak in silence to when you enter a puzzle room, where the game turns off the voices manually and do give you the booping noises. With all the playthroughs I've watched, most people I've seen will not turn the voices off, and I've seen maybe one example of someone changing it to Japanese. Like I just said, changing it to Japanese does get rid of the ellipsis problem and the problem with the questionable voice directing that pops up every once in a while, but everything else we've discussed so far is still present. Of all the quality of life changes, though, the most divisive one amongst fans would have to be the flowchart. I think it's the most significant quality of life change added to the game, both in a good and a bad way, because it's a great change game gameplay-wise and does wonders for the pacing of the game, but from a storytelling perspective, I think it's detrimental. And I'm clearly not the only one that thinks so. But I do find it strange, because the flowchart does make the flow of the game and the overall experience better. Yet people will continue to say that it's damaging to the story of the game. There are several reasons behind this, and it varies from person to person. But before we can get into that, it's important to understand why the flowchart is such a significant upgrade. One big problem the DS version has is having to start the game over from the beginning after getting an ending. This is probably the one thing that stops most people from playing the game to the very end more than anything else. I've seen a lot of comments online saying that they were finally able to finish the game through the port because they weren't forced to go back to the beginning. To make matters worse, you have to go through all the puzzle rooms again as well. None of this would have been a problem if they didn't handle the skip function so poorly. After getting an ending, you have the option to skip text you've already seen. The problem is, is that it's just so slow. For example, it takes around 8 to 10 minutes to skip from the very beginning of the game to the first choice, choosing between doors 4 and 5. That's a freaking long time. In that amount of time, I can skip through the entirety of Kyo's route in Clanad, which took me about 6 minutes. That's significant because the time between the beginning of the game to the first option in 999 is roughly an hour. It took me 7 hours to get through Kyo's route in my original playthrough of Clanad. The game has 5, technically six endings, so going back to the beginning again and again can be taxing. Assuming you get every ending one after the other without getting an ending you've already seen, you'll probably spend two or three hours total just skipping text and redoing puzzle rooms, and that's a generous estimation. What makes it even worse is that it's very unclear to new players which choices you need to make in order to get every ending. It's practically a guessing game trying to figure out how to get to the true ending. 999 is a game that practically requires a guide if you don't want to waste a huge amount of time. I think most people are quick to catch on to that, though there are some that are stubborn when it comes to using guides in video games. I think it would have been great if skipping text was as fast as clan ads in other visual novels, because, honestly, I think starting over from the beginning of the game is beneficial to the story of 999. The flowchart is a great quality of life improvement, but from a story perspective, it's a spoiler. Besides that, it gets rid of one of my favorite aspects of the game. I've been pretty spoiler heavy already with this video, but from this point on I'll be getting into the primary spoilers for 999, so if you've never played the game and are somehow still watching this, skip to this part of the video. The presence of a flowchart just… makes 999 more like Virtue's last reward in Zero Time Dilemma. Sounds like a weird thing to complain about, right? How dare the first game in the Zero Escape series be like the other two games in the Zero Escape series? Let me explain. I don't think 999 would have had nearly as much of an impact on me if the original had a flowchart. The mere presence of one is showing you that multiple timelines exist. When I first played it, I never thought of that possibility. I just thought that I was starting over to get another, better ending. My choices didn't create two separate dimensions, it was me simply going back and choosing another option to change the outcome. It blew my mind when all the pieces fell into place and I realized that each path I was taking was actually Akane going back to the beginning and choosing a better path. It made great use of the 
the fact that you have multiple routes in the game, because you experience what Akane was experiencing, and in turn remember the events from the previous playthroughs. The game has a really solid conclusion, but it's also left open for theories and discussion. There were things left unexplained, and the story is so complex that there are a lot of different theories about what exactly happened, and any of them could have been true. Being part of the Zero Escape community back then honestly added to my overall experience. Back then, you could make the argument that there are multiple timelines, but you could actually rebuttal it and explain yourself. For example, while I was discussing this with my older brother for this video, he told me that when he first played the game, he thought that the different routes you go through where you don't save Akane can't exist anymore because of the paradox. So when you hit that ending, Akane is forced back to the beginning because that timeline was obliterated. He said that because he thought this way, the game operated on a single timeline that just started over until you got it right. That's the coolest thing ever! I never thought of that! I was brought back to the days where I was theorizing with the Zero Escape community on Tumblr, when it actually was a standalone game. But then the sequel came out and put an end to those theories. When I said that the flowchart makes 999 more like the other two Zero Escape games, this is what I mean. It's a game that's better by itself than as a game as part of a series. The flowchart gets rid of the theories that I love, like my brothers. Because with the flowchart, and with the existence of the sequels in general, you know that the timelines in my brother's theory continue to exist. Akane disappears in these timelines and they just keep going on. When Virtue's Last Reward came out, the initial understanding I had of the game had to change. Before VLR, my understanding was similar to my brother's, that there were no timelines, but that Akane was simply going back to the beginning and redoing everything all over again to choose the right path in the same timeline. Starting over wasn't a new path in the flowchart, it was just going back in time to change the results of the future. It was like other visual novels where you just start over and pick a different route. And even after she started over to try and get a different outcome, she still remembered what happened in the other routes because she was the quote-unquote time traveler. That's why I love this game so much to begin with. This being my first experience with a visual novel, I thought it was genius using the different routes as a mechanic in the game to tell the story. The player naturally self-inserts themselves as the role of the narrator, so when it's revealed that the narrator was actually Akane the whole time, I was able to follow along and understand what was happening. This is why so many people initially thought that they themselves were speaking when the twist was just beginning to unfold. He knew because... he knew because I knew. Wait, I knew? What, what does he mean, me? Like, me as in the player? Make it break the fourth wall here? I was easily able to understand that because her and Junpei's minds were one because of the morphogenetic field, Junpei was able to know things he shouldn't. Things he couldn't. With this understanding, the time paradox made sense in a weird way, with Akane getting sick and disappearing in other routes where Junpei failed to save her nine years in the past. I thought it made sense that Snake, Seven, and even Santa remembered Akane dying. The timeline is more or less being messed with and their memories are changing just as Akane is fading in and out of existence. It was almost like she actually did die and then reappeared for the Nonary game, the event where everything would be decided. It was fun to think about the paradox. As much as I love VLR, my perception of the game that I love so much needed to be changed so that it fit the actual canon. There's no reason to theorize anymore because it's spelled out in the sequels. Even with VLR being one of my favorite games, I honestly tried separating the two so that my little theories could still be possible. Because if you look at the game by itself, those things can still be true. But the flowchart now makes that impossible. It is directly connected to VLR. VLR now. It gets rid of one of the reasons I loved the game so much to begin with. VLR works a lot better with timelines and flowcharts as the story was built around it. Restarting from the beginning was annoying on the DS, but for me it was going back in time to change the outcome of events instead of choosing a different timeline. The flowchart gets rid of that aspect. I think that's why the port would have been suited better with a faster skip option. You have the option to ignore the flowchart and to just skip all the text in the DS version, but the skip option didn't improve at all in the port. It's just as slow. This makes the flowchart the best and practically only way to get to the other endings. And that leads me to a bit of a tangent, but I swear it relates to the flowchart. Speaking of the endings, the point in the game that really blew my mind and solidified my understanding of the game was in the true ending, when Santa is leaving the incinerator room with Ace and says what is still my favorite line in the game. Didn't I tell you? I'm Santa Claus. It's time for me to go make a wish come true. This is when my mind went wild, because in this route, Santa never actually said this. He never said anything about being Santa Claus or granting his sister's wish. He told this to Junpei after completing the steam engine puzzle room on the way to the safe ending. To me, this was Santa's way of saying that he knows what's going on and is trying to get Junpei to fully grasp the situation. It's important to note that this scene where Santa tells you about being his sister's Santa Claus has two different versions depending on the route you're on. The route to the knife ending has a condensed version of the scene where he doesn't tell you about his sister's wish and how he was unable to fulfill it. He doesn't even tell you about his sister's death. He instead tells you the story of the two Santa Clauses. 
Did you know that? I don't blame you if you didn't. You don't actually need to see this scene in order to get the safe ending in the port. The scene that made my favorite line in the game have so much meaning, the scene where you first hear about Santa's sister dying nine years ago, is not required to get the safe ending. It doesn't even give you the option. If you want to see it, you have to specifically select that novel section again after filling all the requirements to get the safe ending. But because it doesn't give you any indication on that block on the flowchart that there's a different scene here, it is incredibly likely that you missed it unless you got the safe ending before the knife ending. And because of that, one of the big hints that Akane was the girl that died 9 years ago is gone. You can't make the connection between Santa's sister dying 9 years ago and Clover telling you that a girl died in the nonary game she was in 9 years ago. Snake says in the library puzzle room that the girl that died 9 years ago was named Akane. If you miss the Santa Claus scene, the only connection you make is that Akane Kurashiki might be the girl who died. There is no connection made that Akane is Santa's sister. which by the way, gives you more reason to believe that Santa is actually zero like Snake suggests in the true ending. I didn't realize this when I was playing through the port, and because of that I don't have any footage of it. So I have to use the footage from the DS version of the game. It kind of makes me wonder if there are any other scene variations in the novel sections that people just skip over. I honestly don't know if there is or not, because I only did what was required to do on the flowchart, and I'm not going to go through all the scenes again after several months of playing and watching others play the game. What else could we be missing? Missing, though. The flowchart only has locks in the puzzle blocks, so how many scenes are we actually missing by skipping over them by using the flowchart? This scene, and Santa's line in the true ending, was when I realized that the different routes in the game were important to the story. When I started playing the game for the first time, I wanted to immediately get to the true ending because I didn't think that the other endings would matter since my friend described them as bad endings. Man, I'm glad he told me to get the other endings first, because the game wouldn't have had nearly as much of an impact if I didn't. If I never saw the Santa Claus scene, I I actually wonder if 999 would still be my favorite game or not. And I mean that. It seems like such an insignificant line, but it's the line that made me understand what was going on. It made my mind go all over the place trying to piece together everything that had happened up to that point. It's the line that initially blew my mind. <sighs> okay, sorry for the tangent. Let's go back to Akane. I briefly said before that players naturally insert themselves as the narrator, and I really do think that was Uchikoshi's intent when writing the game. That the player experiences what Akane is experiencing. It's never said outright, but it's implied that Akane went back to the beginning of the game after getting ending, just like the player. With the flowchart, Akane and the audience are no longer having that same experience together, unless she can literally see the flowchart herself like the player and pinpoint exactly where she wants to go. But if that isn't the case, then Akane is starting over in the first puzzle room while the player is zipping around the flowchart trying to open locks and see new information the easy way. This is one of the reasons I think the ending of the game, in general, is harder to understand overall in the port. The player and Akane are distant now. Their actions are different. Not only that, but the player may never be able to insert themselves into the game if they weren't in novel mode, making it an even larger distance between Akane and the audience. The flowchart is great from a gameplay perspective, which is probably more important to most people because 999 is… well, a game. But to me, someone who values a good story over a good game, it diminishes the experience. Okay, since we're already talking about the ending so much, I think it's time to get to the aspect of the game that everyone seems to agree was handled better in the DS version. The big reveal at the end of the game. We talked about how the flowchart changes aspects of the ending, but it's time to talk about how novel and adventure mode fundamentally changed the ending that the game was essentially made for. I told you enough. You get it, don't you? I'm pretty sure you know where this is going, Junpei. Where what is going? Don't play dumb. You know things you shouldn't. Things you couldn't. So, a quick recap of the story and the build-up for the primary plot twist. If you don't wish to hear it, skip to this part of the video. In the DS version, you had two screens present at all times, with the character dialogue being on the top screen and the narration being on the bottom screen. Throughout the game, you get hints on what could be happening, and at the same time, if you go through every route, you learn that all the characters have a connection with not only each other, but with another nonary game that happened 9 years ago on this exact ship, as well as another building in Nevada. Regarding that incident, you learn that there were kidnappings involving 16 children. You hear Seven's backstory and how he was a cop and investigated it, leading him to be kidnapped and put on the ship where the children were at. You get several hints from Clover that she was one of the kidnapped children, and she suggests that Santa might have been as well. She also tells you that a girl died during the experiment. You learn from Lotus that her two daughters were involved, etc. Meanwhile, throughout the game, you learn a bunch of crazy pseudoscience stuff, all of them loosely connected with the morphogenetic field theory, a phenomenon that grants communication between two people without the need of physical contact. 
Near the end of the game, you learn that Ace and the Ninth Man were partners and helped create the Nonary game from nine years past, and that his purpose was to test the morphogenetic field theory. The cast concludes that Santa is probably zero and made this Nonary game as revenge for what they did. You learn that Snake was part of the game as well, and he reveals that the girl that died was named Akane. You eventually realize that Junpei was the only one that didn't have anything to do with nine years ago. Later, Seven regains his memories and reveals that the name of the little girl was Akane Kurashiki, who was currently on the ship with you, playing the Nonary game. You eventually catch up with the rest of the characters and confront Santa about being Zero. He tells you that he isn't Zero, but is instead more of an assistant. Santa then tells them that they're partially wrong about this Nonary project being revenge for what happened in the first Nonary game. The real purpose of the game was to save Akane Kurashiki, his sister, who died nine years ago. Akane, who was just in the room with everyone, is suddenly gone on, and the game goes freaking crazy as the narrator takes over and explains that she was younger Akane the whole time using the morphogenetic field set to see through Junpei's eyes nine years into the future. She would choose certain paths for Junpei, and when she failed, she simply went back and started over to pick a different path. From the bottom screen, she was pretty much doing everything. She then describes what she had gone through through the first Nonary game, and now she's at the incinerator where she's supposed to die. So, through the morphogenetic field, you help young Akane solve the last puzzle which leads her to safety, saving her life. Life. Man, that was harder to explain than I thought. As said before, the story was built around the Nintendo DS, so you can imagine why most people agree that the original version handled this better. We've spoken several times already about how they handled the unique aspects of the game when porting it, it being novel mode and adventure mode. So how did this change affect the plot twist that the game was made for? Even with the game trying to show you the two different modes at the beginning, it can still be unclear to people because it's a unique feature. There are times where you could switch to novel mode and little to no text would be different. So, to people who who check during these parts, it's easy to assume that it's just a different text format. On used pizza's playthrough, he switched just at the right time to see that he had missed a ton of text. Whoa! Lore! Okay, this is the better screen. On Spiked Vegeta's playthrough, legitimately on the very next line from where pizza switched, he decides to switch and sees that there isn't that much text that he was missing out on. Okay, I thought it was gonna be like, very different perspectives. Okay. Most people will stick with one mode the entirety of their playthrough. The only time they'll think about it is maybe at the beginning when deciding which one they like best. But after that, they'll ignore the existence of the other screen entirely, making it feel as if the other mode is just a very strange alternative. With the DS, however, we're constantly reading the narration on the bottom screen as well as reading what the characters are saying on the top screen. They are both always present throughout the entire game. This, along with what we've already said about the audience and Akane having the same experiences makes the big reveal have a huge impact. It makes sense and we're blown away. Being aware of the existence of both realities is key. People who are in novel mode seem to be less confused from what I've seen, but people in adventure mode can barely keep up. Based on the 30 or so playthroughs I watched and scanned over, of course, it didn't seem like a lot of people caught on to what was happening when playing the port, or at least people who are in adventure mode. The game literally has to spell it out for you when they changed the name of the two modes to Junpei Vision and a Kane Vision. The port had to dance around the twist that originally had the DS's dual screens in mind to try to make sense of it on a single screen. The twist at the end now just seems contrived and forced. It makes it very apparent that it was made with something else in mind. To the game's credit, it still makes sense when it comes down to it, but it isn't nearly as natural to figure out what's happening like in the DS version. Granted, there's so much information that you have to process that it can be difficult to know what's going on to begin with, but the gist of it is conveyed pretty well. With the DS, it may seem weird that you're looking at the same scenery for both the top and bottom screen, but most would just assume that they had to do something for the extra screen and they deal with it. When the twist does happen, it dawns on the player and it makes sense. After the reveal in the original version, to further solidify that the top and bottom screens are now separate realities, and to better help the audience better understand what's happening, Junpei's thoughts and feelings are now only revealed through the top screen, and the narration is a separate thing entirely. Akane, the narrator, is in danger right at that moment, so the time for narration narration of what she's seeing through Junpei's eyes is over. The same kind of thing happens in the port, but now it doesn't really serve a purpose. Why are Junpei's thoughts suddenly silent when the rest of the game we could hear them echo in his head? The weird blue lines that indicated that he was thinking to himself aren't consistent anymore. Sometimes they show up when he's thinking to himself, and sometimes they don't. If adventure mode really is Junpei vision, then why isn't it the same as from the beginning of the game? The plot twist shouldn't change that. <sighs> but whatever, it's fine. As long as I get my Sudoku pop.
You know, my favorite moment in the game, amongst all the great moments that it had, was turning my DS upside down to save a little girl from certain death. Seeing her terrified face full of tears filled me with determination. It really sucked me into the situation, and that face never left you throughout the duration of the puzzle. During the whole game, younger Akane was essentially doing the hard work for Junpei, solving all these puzzles. Doing a puzzle for a second and third time can be a chore, but it really brought the point home that Akane already knew the solutions to all these problems because she had already done them before. You practically memorize the first puzzle solution and are out of there in no time, much like Akane would have from her experience. It was hard work for her, but now it's Junpei's turn. He's going to do this on his own, with his own mind. With your DS now upside down, Junpei is now finally doing the actions of the game to save Akane. I'm not an emotional guy, as you can probably tell, but this game really brought something out from inside me. But I don't feel anything as I play the ending in the port. I was never able to be absorbed into this world. The point was really driven home that Akane was behind everything Junpei did because you did every action on the bottom screen. The port's roundabout way of hinting towards this moment is whether or not it shows Junpei's face before the escape, depending on which mode you're in. Like, am I even playing the same game anymore? All the feelings I experienced in the DS version are absent when I play the port. I'm sure that there are a lot of people that got those feelings when playing the port, but I'm not talking about other people right now. All the intense feelings I got when playing the DS version are nowhere to be found. I feel nothing when I see... God, what even is this? Akane's sobbing face is only seen briefly before going into the puzzle now, when before was always present, and with novel and adventure modes switching back and forth so often now, when before the majority of people stuck with only one mode throughout the entire game, it's just unnaturally difficult to have a full grasp of what's going on. The true ending is now just a mess of its former self. It pains me that I can't recommend this game in good faith anymore. Recommending it would also be going into an explanation about the port and why I think the DS version is the best way to go. Of course they'll ask about the port, so I have to say that other people liked it. Other people think it's the best version. Other people recommend that version over the original. Because what value does my opinion hold over a sea of thousands? I know they'll just end up playing the port in the end because it's the cheapest, most accessible, and more visually appealing option. Either that, or they'll just download a ROM, which would be fine, except for some reason the actual ROM of 999 doesn't work very well with the default settings for most DS emulators. On most DS playthroughs you can find on YouTube, the majority of the footage looks really blocky and jagged, and the audio quality is pretty terrible too. So if someone were to theoretically download 999 on a ROM, they'd need to mess around with the graphic and audio settings and make sure that it actually looks and sounds normal. Ugh. I'm done comparing the two versions of the game. I really needed to get it off my chest as I've been holding it in for a while now. I honestly wish I could get over the changes they made to the writing, especially since the quality of life changes are so great. But I can't. I tried to look over the dialogue, tried to assume that maybe a group of people could normally act like this. I tried to put myself in the shoes of someone who's never played the game. I tried to give it a pass, tried to figure out why so many people don't have a problem with it, tried to play devil's advocate with myself to validate the awkward writing and creative decisions, but I soon realized that I shouldn't have to try and justify and rationalize these things. I should be able to just recommend the game without having to warn them about something. I should be able to recommend it with full confidence, without any extra BS like telling them to expect awkward character dialogue or how playing in a certain mode is the best way to experience the game. But I can't do that with the port. The only version I can recommend without any strings attached, despite its shortcomings, is the original. There are still plenty of reasons to like the port, as I touched upon a few times during the duration of the video. The quality of life changes are great, the character models look cleaner, the flowchart paces the game in a better way, voice acting is a nice option to have, being able to skip text when before the text was always at a fixed, unskippable speed, these are all nice changes. But when it comes down to it, are these changes really enough to justify the negative changes to the writing? I want to reiterate that the port of 999 is not a bad game, as much as I hate saying that, and that everything I've said is more or less me trying 
trying to explain why I was personally disappointed with the game rather than trying to convince you that it's lesser than the original version. The story is still good despite the poorly written dialogue, and even with the more important twists losing their impact, the majority of the game is still interesting and engaging. I talked a lot about certain plot twists that were changed for the port, but there are a lot of important twists that essentially stay the same and have the same effect. I had my issues with it, obviously, but when it comes down to evaluating it as a whole, it's still a good game. I'm sure you can make just as many arguments against the DS version as I did with the port, and it's not like everyone that's ever played the DS version loved it to death like I did. I, I do feel like a lot of dialogue in this game is extraordinarily repetitive and redundant. <laughs> Which again, I guess it was kind of a style choice. They want to make absolutely sure that nobody has any questions about what they're supposed to do right now. And it'd be really cool if those of you who do have those arguments commented so we can have a discussion about it. However, when it comes to the changes that they made to the game to fit it on one screen, I feel that the magic that made the original so special to me and others is lost. If you have no other way of playing 999, then the port is still a good option. Plus, the port comes bundled with its sequel, Virtue's Last Reward, which is still great no matter what system you're playing it on. However, if you're asking me for my recommendation, then the choice is clear and obvious. It will always be the DS version. Personally, I don't think I'll ever go back to the port. I probably won't be replaying the game for a few years anyway because of how many times I had to watch and play it for this video. It's unfortunate that buying the original version is so expensive now, but in my opinion, it's worth it.